heaven Deliver me in a black wing bird I think of flying Down into a sea of pens and feathers And all other instruments of faith And sex and God The belly of a black Don't try to feed me Cause I've been here before And I deserve a little more I belong In the service of a queen I belong uh, I'm Ryan Brown and this is the Unvarnished Podcast and I'm in Boston um, Today uh, just flew in yesterday, uh, getting used to the time difference and uh, the humidity. <laughs> uh, and I'm with, uh, God, I'm going to start over. That was an awful introduction. The, humi the humidity is not even that bad this week. No, I'm just, I, I sweat so much anyways. You should have seen it uh, last week. It was, it was insane. Yeah. Man, I, I, we're thinking about moving to the East Coast, and, um, and that's, I'm a little nervous about that because I sweat a lot anyway. Um, okay, so I am Ryan Brown. This is the Unvarnished Podcast, and I'm in Boston um, at the studio of Leo Mancini, right? It's uh, Leo Mancini. What, what is... So everybody have just a... called me Mancini in yeah. Italy, obviously. Yeah. But um, growing up here, I'm Leo Mancini Horesco. Mancini Horesco. Yep. Okay. I've always had both names, but if you live in Italy, the Italian name is going to get a lot more use. Right, right. Okay. Leo Mancini Horesco, um, and we met uh, uh, back in 2003. I was 26. You were probably what 19. Um, no, I would have been 22. 22. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was in my first year. I had just graduated BYU um, and went to the Florence Academy 2003, um, and we didn't spend a lot of time then well you were uh, in the together. studios on the other side of the hallway right right you know uh and and uh and then i left ran out of money and came back in 2007 january 2007 um and you were in bandera yeah surprising point. everyone i was still there yeah <laughs> well you were teaching at that point right? yeah, yeah um and i i only spent one trimester in Bandera. So uh, we didn't over, even then when we were, when I was there for a lot longer period of time, I, we didn't overlap a, a ton. Yeah. Um, ben, were you there for the opening of the studio of Puerto Romana? No, no, I was there. Uh, I, I went to Puerto Romana after it had already been, uh, been going. But, yeah. Uh, and then, yeah. So when I came back in 2007, I was in Cassine for one trimester and then mm -hmm. Bandera for one trimester and then straight to Puerto Romana, which was great because Bandera was kind of dingy with the, with the light. And then they, they had that rainstorm. I don't know if you remember. I will never forget where that the rainstorm flooded up. And no, I mean, my, so much of my stuff got damaged. Yeah, because you, you were in the far back where it was the deepest. Yeah, no, I mean, it was eight inches of standing water in my yeah. studio. It was insane. And it wasn't just water. It was like... Oh, I know. Sewage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm very aware. <laughs> Disgusting. Yeah, I was there. Uh, 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 it was the for first For those time. that don't know, the, the Bandera Studios was underground. Yeah. It used to be a, a car park, so you went down a ramp to get into the studios, and uh, and when it, a heavy rain came, the sewage came up through the drains. So I had really shitty paintings, like yeah. every single one. <laughs> yeah. Even if it was good, it was shitty. <laughs> they... they, they no, I mean, it worked out okay in the end. I think we came up with some systems. The problem that first storm wasn't just that it was coming up. It's that because we're below grade, the drains in the street were clogged. And yeah. it was coming down the ramp into yeah. the studio, like filling like a, a swimming pool. Yeah. Which and we was, were there with like yeah, trash yeah. cans and dragging them out to the street and dumping them. It was, it was awful. Um, but yeah, and then the lowest part of the studio was the furthest the model to, the, to the back. Yeah. Yeah. So we were dragging raw sewage out for hours. It was really fun. That's, I mean, good memories. In retrospect, I think it was a really fortunate time to be there because yeah. it was, um, 
chaotic and all these different studios with their own kind of individual subculture yeah. and characters. Like every studio had a couple of professionals working in them yep. and then a bunch of students. Um, I think it was quite an interesting time because you could have things like the sewage problem or I got electrocuted. Uh, yeah. Were you there for that? No. Yeah, I got, I think, I think I was in the studio with Tim McGuire, I think, maybe he, rem or maybe, who else would have been there? Um, that, that, you're talking about in Bandera or? No, this was, was in Cazine. Oh, this okay. was maybe 2000 or 2001. Um, yeah, I reached down and there was exposed wire yeah. um, behind somebody's cast setup and I was going to unplug this light and I got electrocuted and shot across the room. Wow. It was a real like formative, you know, hair on your chest kind of experience. Yeah. But I think that that's a, I mean, embracing the kind of chaos that went on in that studio was still a lot more structured than my life was up until then. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun. And I think, I don't know, there's something about art schools that aren't, aren't too institutional yeah. and are more based on mentorship. So each of those studios, I think people would like ally themselves with some of the students or some of the teachers. And, and I don't know, I think as the school's gotten larger and it's all under one roof, which I haven't even, I haven't seen this has happened. It's gorgeous. You know, but they're so pampered now. Yeah, I mean it's it's different, right? Yeah, like it's it's a uh, it's a well, different. It felt experience. like uh, as well, you know, along with just the sort of familial uh, environment. Everybody knew each other pretty well. You're spending all day, every day uh, yeah. together. There was also, a, I guess, a feeling of, or at least from my perspective, um, like you you were also kind of contributing to it. You know, mm. you felt like a, a certain ownership over the environment because because it was it was so small that you felt like you you actually had a voice and yeah. could contribute and 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 you kind of I, for me I, I was desperate to kind of give back because I was so grateful for what I was getting um and I was it just felt so good to be a part of it and feel like you were a part of it instead yeah. of just another number coming through um, and yeah, now that it's a, a little bit bigger, I, I wonder what, it, you know, what the experience is like for students, yeah. if, it, if it still feels the same or. I mean, like I, I was a student who was very not experienced and the uh, experienced, like Ramiro Sanchez was doing these incredible, large life-size figure paintings um, that were, you know, he, he had a career going already. And he's just like, hey man, I need some help. Like we're stretching canvas today yeah. and we would restretch things and make, make materials and I don't know it felt it felt like half apprenticeship at yeah. the time I think and, yeah. I, and I I don't know for me I, I I think back and think how fortunate it was to be there at that time right. pre-internet I found the school entirely by chance yeah I didn't know about it I was just on a study abroad program and I heard there was a school that could really teach people how to draw yeah and I, I wandered the streets of the city yeah Without exaggerating, I, I wandered and I ended up at the Liceo Artistico, which is at uh, Puerto Romana, and that's an artistic high school. And I walked in and I saw all these plaster casts with graffiti all over them and all these high school students. I'm like, wow, I'm definitely not in the right school, but I'm also, this is amazing. Yeah. Because I had just gone to, you know, traditional art schools in the States beforehand. And frankly, I thought everybody that painted really well was not alive. Sure. Um, so I don't know. I, I think in retrospect, it was a really good time, both for me personally and for the school to have been there. What uh, I, I want to know more about that, what you just said, um, you, you felt like the, anyone that painted well was not alive. Um, what's your background that would have led you to that opinion so early? Because for me, I, you know, I didn't come from an art background. I, mm. Nobody I knew growing up was an artist I was I didn't know anything about anything yep. um, so the idea that uh, what what was good painting and um, I mean I, gosh I didn't know anything about anything so so I had no context to figure out which direction I wanted to go or which artists to look at 
I guess maybe I'd heard of Norman Rockwell, but I didn't really know any, yeah. any artists. What was your background that allowed you to have that clarity uh, so early? Um, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't feel that early to me now, but yeah. it is. I think kids today figure out this stuff a lot earlier. Yeah. Because they... Internet access yeah, they just to have, schools have been... Totally. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and the webs of communication are so complicated. Like everybody... I bump into people that sort of know what traditional academic training and atelier style schools are now, and they're not, I don't know. Back then it was very different. I mean, I, I grew up here in Boston and I, I only ever knew one real easel painter who was my dad's roommate in college. He's since passed away, he's called Bruno Civitico, and he had a fair amount of success um, through the 60s, 70s, into the 80s, and I think you know, started a real like hard drinking lifestyle. And, and eventually um, he passed away a couple of years ago. He was in Charleston, South Carolina, but he was the only person I had seen that was alive that could like render. Yeah. You know, he could paint a room that he could paint this, us sitting here with light falling on us. And it was, it was amazing. And I, I was only, I don't know, it was my son's age. I was like, I was a kid, I was eight or nine years old. And I remember asking him like, who can paint? And he's just like, nobody. Yeah. He gave you the, the most jaded response possible. No one can teach you. No one knows how to paint. Um, and, you know, maybe that was kind of true for a minute there. Um, but uh, as I got older, I got really into doing graffiti. And that's how I came to painting and drawing in general. I was a grade school student and I liked drawing. And I just had a really like influential grade school art teacher who me and a couple other boys in the school, he just put copies of uh, subway art in front of us. Yeah. Um, and I would just copy letters and, um, and, you know, characters, like cartoon characters, all day out of this book. And it was amazing um, because I think at that point I had this kind of idea. You know, my mother went to art school. My dad's an architect. But in the 80s and early 90s, it felt like very... I don't know, it didn't feel that welcoming to spend all day in a sketchbook. And graffiti immediately gave me license to like spend 12 hours a day drawing and develop this kind of like fraternity community concept around our group of friends that would go and get into trouble. The problem with it is like an incredible amount of chaos yeah. came with it. So by the time I had gone to Italy, I'd been through the court system uh, thoroughly and <laughs> And, and, I, and I had a suspended sentence, which is part of the reason why I wanted to get out of Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, and it was all for graffiti. It's like stuff that today isn't really looked at as a big deal, but um, it, it was, I mean, it was serious. The yeah. other guys that I was friends with, everybody did a little bit of time. Some people did a lot of time. Yeah. My parents' house was raided with a search warrant. Wow. I mean, it was like, it was really just full chaos. Yeah. Um, the good news is, is I think that the sort of discipline of spending 10 hours a day drawing in this, like, I, I don't know if fraternity is the right word, but this like community concept yeah. where everybody works together and exchanges ideas. Those things were very familiar to me by the time I came to Florence. Yeah. So I was willing to spend all day drawing and painting. I was willing to help people out. We we're willing to bounce ideas off each other. And I slowly did less graffiti yeah. along the way. Um, but I came to Florence with just the intention of being, intention of being away for three to six months yeah. so that I could come back to the States and continue getting into trouble here. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I ended up staying 11 years. Wow. So the three month study abroad program became six. And then when I found the Florence school, so it's at that time, this is fall of 2000, um, there was John Angel School was just opening. Yeah, uh, I think they, they had just split. Yeah, right. they, 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 they it was just opening, and um, and Charles Cecil's school I found first. Yeah, which was super interesting because he was the first person that made me understand that Boston had cachet for painting. Yeah, um, I walked into his studio. It's quite an odd experience, like walking into, uh, I mean, it's like this, you know, a Northlit, right, right. Northlit, big space. Um, 
And he was so excited I was from Boston. And he's like, oh, he's from Boston. But he would only speak to me through a proxy at the time. He had, um, he had one of the guys that worked with him and one of his teaching assistants. And he'd say, you should tell him he should come to my lecture tonight. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, I, and I really like Charles. And I've, I, I've enjoyed spending some, but like my first impression of him was so strange, this meeting. Um, but at that point, there was a lot of bad blood between his school and the Florence Academy. Yeah. And I made the mistake of in Charles's studio, like on a day when he was, I think he was trying to be really nice to me saying, oh, you're from Boston. Like people, you know, you should do this. You should do that. I let it slip. I was like, oh, I think I'm going to go to the Florence Academy to draw tonight. Yeah. And like he, he just went ballistic. <laughs> um, so I didn't, I didn't actually, so I found Charles's school first, then I mentioned I would go to the Florence Academy. I loved Charles's school. It was yeah. amazing. Um, but I ended up applying to the Florence Academy. It was quite small. At that point, I think it was yeah. le less than 50 students. Right. And Via Luna had maybe just opened. Um, the sculpture program had just launched. Yeah, I mean, that's 50 students uh, between drawing, painting, and sculpture. Yeah, but at that point, it was a much smaller school sure. in terms of... Um, Regardless, I almost ended up there by default because I, I had such a bad impression at the other schools that I went to the Florence Academy and everybody seemed so, so sane and normal yeah. by comparison. And I, um, and I remember looking around the model room and thinking like, I'll never get in here because every art school that I had been to, and I had done the rounds growing up, like my parents were very supportive and did their best to keep me out of trouble. Um, so they signed me up for classes at um, the museum school here in Boston and at uh, RISD summer program and, um, you know, night classes at some of the, you know, tech universities, like anything to sort of support these things, putting me in a better direction. In any of those places, it would be like a room of people drawing and one or two people could kind of do it. And I'd try to stand near them and figure out as much as I could. But I walked around the model room at the Florence and I was like, wow, like everybody's good. Yeah. Like it's a school of savants. They won't <laughs> let me in. But it, it literally didn't occur to me that, um, that they had a method yeah. that could be taught that could bring everybody's level up. Like right. it just didn't seem possible. Yeah. I mean, that, that was my experience too. I went there uh, not knowing what to expect, knowing that I wasn't quite as good enough as mm -hmm. I wanted to be, but having no idea that, uh, that there was a, there was a, a way of presenting information that was understandable, digestible, and you could make regulated progress. Right. Uh, uh, in the same way that you learn addition and subtraction and then multiplication and then, you know, on and on and on with, with math, that there was a way to do that with drawing and painting. Yeah. Um, it was m mind blowing when I first experienced it. Um, I, I came home and I, and I thought, um, you know, nobody in Utah had heard of it in 2003. Right. So I, I started teaching at two universities and um, students really embraced it. Um, but fa faculty was unfamiliar with it. So I don't think they embraced it as much. But it was just so effective. I just couldn't believe how effective uh, yeah. that, that way of teaching was. Well, it was the, you know, it was the just express yourself period. Right. You know, right. like I really... I remember being so angry because I was in a drawing class and to me at that point, like an hour was a lot of time yeah. and I would like fill these sketchbooks, right? And on like half the pages would be letters and on the other half the pages would be figures. And I remember asking the teacher, I went up at the end of the class and I said, listen, like, I think you can tell like I'm a little, my needs are a little, like I, I would really like more time because to me like an hour was a long time on yeah. drawing at that point. And I was like, maybe like three hours we could work from the figure. Maybe you could teach me a little bit about anatomy. And I remember at the point being livid because she just, she thought for a long time, she's like, you know, Leo, I think, I think you just need to be more expressive. And I was mad at her for like, yeah, I was mad. I was still mad about that experience when I had already trained and I, probably when I was already selling pictures, like, you know, later. Um, but then it occurred to me like, you know, 10 years ago or something like, of course, like she didn't know how to teach what, what I was asking. Yeah. She knew how to teach what she was taught. Right. Um, and 
I think a really nice thing about when I found Florence was like day one at the school in Dan's studio, um, it was me and three other students, I think, yeah. was the starting group. And Dan sat us down and he just said, this is not an art school. He said, here you will learn skills and techniques. And if you are lucky, you will go on and make art later. Yeah. And I think that that was a really strong, clear message and was so different than anything I had heard before. Yeah. Um, and I hope it's still like that. Like, I hope, I, I think that every art school should have an aspect of that. Like, we will teach you techniques and then go off and do what you want and yeah. we will fully support you. Right. You know, I think that would be like the strongest message you could give a young person. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I've, um, I've become a little bit critical of that uh, uh, one aspect of that message, although I, I generally agree um, that the skill development should should be the main focus uh, because you don't want to you don't want to feed people uh, you know a vision or or try to get them to think that. Um, they should be making this type of art or that type of art. Right. You want to allow for the individ individuality to organically evolve. Um, but I, I guess the, the one criticism I would have of the message is because art is never talked about, um, I think more students adopt the study as the art. And I think... Uh, I agree you shouldn't necessarily uh, artificially feed the student's vision. I think you should encourage them to be developing it simultaneously with yeah. their skills. And, and I think uh, the focus being solely on skills, the only criticism I would have of that is I, I wish there were more of a, a, conver a consistent conversation about why they're developing their skills. What is the post application of these skills um, to, to allow the students to be really focused when they're in front of a model or in front yeah. of a cast, but with the, uh, the over overarching focus of I'm doing this for this thing that comes later. I'm trying to figure out how to turn form or how to uh, uh, be better at anatomy or proportion because I'm working on this thing at home that needs to be better, right? Um, and I, I think that's the only thing I, I think maybe the academies, you know, all of the academies could improve on is a little bit more discussion about why, why the skill development. Well, you know, I think at the time that we were there, we, we got taught just by example, right? Like yeah. there was just, there was people that were teaching and were good teachers. And then there was people that were um, showing their pictures yeah. actively and having exhibitions. And you could see them framing and making money and yeah. dealing with shipping. Um, and a lot of them had studios in the school. In the school or nearby the school. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that in some sense the best, you know, it's as much about figuring out what you want to do as figuring out what you don't want to do. Yeah. And I agree with you that I think everybody conflates these kind of like academic studies with, with real work. Yeah. And I, I would submit, I think, I don't think this is that controversial, that there's, there's so many people that have trained now at this point, much more than, um, you know, the teachers of the mid 20th century who felt like a very, you know, lonely few. Yeah. I don't think they ever could have imagined how many people with skill would be out here now. Yeah. But the problem is that the, the, the internet, the, the galleries, the people studios are just flooded with these things that ostensibly look like studies of the school, right? Not like individual, um, works of art. Yeah. And I don't know if that's really the right message. If you want, like if the point of these art schools is to lift up and create artists, yeah. um, you know, the, the adhering to technique to the point where everything starts to look the same, yeah. I, I view as a really big problem. Yeah. And again, like, I mean, think about the crew in the model room when we were there, like, I think there was a lot of individual approach and that was encouraged. I don't know if it was enough, but it was, it was, you know, I don't think anybody painted like 
Dan Graves did. Sure. And no one really painted like Ramiro did. And everybody sort of figured out a little lane at that point that was um, helpful. And anything, if you teach the doctrine and you adhere to it too closely, by nature of it being a school, you're in a self-diluting pool. Like you go from being a big fish in a small pond, the pond's just going to keep getting bigger. Yeah. The fish stays the same size. It just starts getting smaller and smaller. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was very, it was a nice part about leaving because I was there a long time was sort of like realizing, looking from the outside, um, what parts of it I really want to bring with me and what parts are, you know, our school. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's it's an old problem. I've read quotes from the 19th century where they say, you know, for every thousand, um, you know, artists that graduate through the academies, there's uh, one that has something to say. The rest are copyists. Mm. Um, and I, so, so it's inevitable that there's a certain dogma that will evolve and exist. Um, and it's 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 going to be the few that that come out and develop their own vision. Yep. Um, and have that um, that unique voice uh, that really expands beyond the their upbringing and their environment. But um, but yeah, I, I I think Florence Academy was nice because it, it to me at least it, it didn't seem to have an absolute approach. Some some schools have more of a really absolute step one, step two, step three, yeah. and. And so there's those, you know, it's really hard to discern one student's work from another's yeah. uh, when, when the method is so uh, absolute. But um, I've got this train going by. Well, it's very romantic. <laughs> I mean, this is my studio. You get the train going by. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I'd like to see more um, individuality, but uh, I, I don't know... You know, I, I've realized that it's a it's a twofold problem. One being I institutional or systemic, where yeah. um, it's getting really loud. We can so close I, the window. No, man. no, no. We'll just give it a second. Um, uh, where the si the system itself, I think, should encourage at least the conversation of of that individual development. But then, ultimately, it's up to the individual to to actually do it. So. Um, for any art students out there, the only the, the advice that I would give is no matter where you're going, try to make y your own paintings outside of that uh, as, as often as possible, um, because it's in your own studio with your own thoughts, with your own motivations, where you're going to you're really going to find yourself. Um, so, um, OK, so. From, can, I, can I say one more thing? Yeah, about please, that? please. Because I think, and, and I don't know, people will hate this, some people, but I think it's, I, I think it's true. There's another issue, which is that like art schools, as much as they are, like for me, I was so fortunate. It changed my life. I am forever grateful. Not, I mean, to the Florence Academy primarily. Sure. Um, but to some of the other art teachers I had too, down to my grade school art teacher. Um, the problem with these, as it gets closer to an artist career, is that the people that are teaching in art schools are often primarily educators sure. and not necessarily exhibiting artists. Yeah. And I've been very careful as I've you know, made a slowly accrued a group of students around me, I have no intention of being a full-time educator. I don't want to have a school. I, I don't wanna be beholden to the processes of a school. And the advice that I often give to young people is like if you're in a school, you find the professionals within it that yeah. you um, that you gravitate most towards, and and just stay very near them. And again, like that's that's a graffiti lesson. That's yeah. not an art. Like th I just knew that coming there. That whoever was um, making real moves in their career, that's going to be the people you learn the most from. And when people are professional educators, their primary thing that they're doing with teaching, paying the bills. I mean, there's entire schools of people that primarily teach and yeah. paint for. I, I don't think that that's as good of an example, and I don't think you can get art from that. It's it's harder to squeeze water out of a rock yeah. than it is a sponge. Yeah, I, I think you have to... Um, I, I guess one of the things I try to tell the students is, as early on as you can, to 
be very, very honest with yourself about what your priorities are. Yeah. Um, and you know, some people it's, I got to make money. I, I, I want that. I want to be financially stable. Um, uh, that definitely affects what you choose to paint. Um, it, it can affect sizes and it can affect subject matter. It can, mm -hmm. it can affect, uh, how you choose to paint. Maybe you have to be really productive. So you choose to, to, uh, not be as refined. I mean, it, there's a million different f follow ups to that one decision of, of what your priority is going to be. Um, for some people it's, I want to get as good as I can. I, I quality is everything. And so you put so much time into, uh, just getting better, um, with each work. Uh, and, and that has its, its own limitations, right? Maybe you don't market as much, maybe you don't spend as much time, or, or maybe you spend a lot of time on an individual painting. So you're not producing as much, which means you need to sell them for more. And uh, again, there's so many, uh, consequences to these decisions. But if you can be really honest and say, this is the most important thing to me, then your life has to adjust to, to make those things possible. For a mm. lot of people, they say, you know, I want to be really great. And, and, but they're, but they're not willing to go to art school for it. Mm. They're not willing to like go to the academy. And I say, well, then all you, if it's not possible at the moment, then you have to adjust whatever you have to adjust to make it possible. Uh, because if that's the most important thing, then you have to do whatever you can to, to, to achieve it. Um, and then in your career, it's the, it's the same thing after you, maybe, maybe you go to art school, you, you develop the skills. Um, and then it's a matter of, uh, now what, you know, you know, you know uh, that old uh, quote, I think it's an Ives Gamble quote, maybe, um, for, maybe, but the only student worth encouraging is that which you cannot discourage. Yeah. You know, and I think that like the primary thing has to be the act of painting itself, the like giving yourself over to it, like a monastic kind of discipline. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, my paintings look very different now than when I was an art student and very different than when I was a teenager. Yeah. Um, but the act has always stayed the same. You know, you wake up, you go somewhere and you paint all day and, um, giving yourself over to that fully, I think makes other things very possible. Whereas if your concerns are practical, like this is an impractical profession. Yeah. I have kids, you have kids, bills, mortgages, like, yeah. it, you know, it's, it's an incredibly impractical way to make a career. Um, but it's a great way to make a life and a family and a community and, um, and it does work out, but I like, I've answered that question by putting painting, trying to put painting first and yeah. trying to push, you know, and the Sisyphus ch task of like just pushing the rock up the hill every day. Yep. And I think that that pays dividends. It's the most, it's the most gratifying part of the job is yeah. just knowing that there's peaks and valleys ahead and amazing yeah. experiences and really, really poor ones. And, um, and yeah, that you just sort of relinquish yourself to it. Yeah. And you said, we were talking earlier, you said something about you have to love it on the days you hate it or, or, or it's, I, that's not exactly how you put it, but yeah, I mean that, that, yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard concept to like s sum up, right? Like we're at a point now, you and I, I've known you almost 20 years. Um, the people that we saw 20 years ago working, many of them are now gone. Yeah. Right. People that are incredibly talented and sold paintings for, for good money. And, yeah. You know, I wished I had the skill that some of them did. I wish that I'd had the opportunities that some of them had, but they right. go on to do different things. And I realized after moving back to Boston and, and I really like reinvented my life from scratch here. And I've been independent the whole time I've come back, not, you know, I do little workshops with schools here and there, but I, I really have tried to maintain autonomy. And I realized that the de deciding factor is not how we deal with success. Like it's, it's easy to sell a painting. It's so easy to get paid for a commission. It is so easy to get a call from me. Like all those things are easy. Everybody can do them. What defines you is how you deal with the low points right? How you deal with the spots in between where you don't know what's around the corner. I think that that's like a much more challenging, um, prospect. 
my problem, like what I'm dealing with is I've just become kind of, I think I've become kind of numb to it. So, you know, a painting sells, yeah, great, but it doesn't, you don't feel the same joy that sure. you did years ago. It's just, you know, it's another one. Yeah. And a painting doesn't sell or gets rejected from somewhere. Or the client wants you to repaint something, whatever. I don't really feel that either. Hmm. So I, I do miss a little bit like the, the elation of the yeah. good days. But I think that I'm very resilient with the low points. Yeah. And, I, and I would say that that's something that maybe people don't consider when they're 18 and 20 years old. Because when I was that age, I quickly started selling lots of paintings. And I just thought my life, I thought I was going to make a ton of money. Yeah. Oh, my life was going to be easy. Um, but then you slowly, you build up a resilience, like a callus. Yeah. And I think that that's maybe one of the most important things. Yeah, it, it kind of evens out. The, when, when you have those moments of elation, maybe you win an award, maybe you, uh, um, you know, sell something. At a, at a higher price than you have before or, or get a good commission, um, you feel the same. You, as high as the peak is, the valley is. If you, mm -hmm. if you don't get an award, if you don't get in a show, if you get rejected by a gallery, and, and over time, like you said, that callus builds up to where the, the peaks aren't as high, the valleys it's, aren't as low, exactly, and it's just yeah. a little bit more even of a, yep. you just know this is, this is what it is, it happens. I maybe miss the peaks a little. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but, but hold on, let me, let, me, let me say something else, which is like, coming back here, I got the opportunity to paint with some older painters that were just so jubilant and enthusiastic about painting. And I thought back to this first guy I met when I was like, you know, a kid, my dad's roommate, Bruno Civitico. And the guy was so jaded. Yeah. And I realized that there's this like propensity of, of artists to get like more jaded over time. And, and that must be avoided yeah. at all costs. So yeah. by making the painting the central thing and not the successes and just really to love what you do yeah. is, is a hard project, but it will give you longevity. Yeah. You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm very cautious to not work on things that I don't want to and not, you yeah. know, not give myself projects I, I would hate to do. Yeah. Um, because I think it has to come with a place of like, love joy and joy and yeah. i think it comes through um you know the joie de vivre kind of yeah. concept and calligraphy and i don't know i'm just i think that's character and is very important in painting yeah um and it's what we all bring to the table along with skill and yeah. whatever like we're all different yeah i just had a a, a, a new collector yeah. um come to my studio and um young guys getting into art kind of he's new to it but he's he's just so excited and uh, i've never had this before but um he said i want to commission you to do a painting i love your work what are the paintings you want to make mm. and i was like what did you just say uh, 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 the question coming out of a collector's mouth just never occurred to me that that mm -hmm. might happen and I sent him, I don't know, 30, 40 images of stuff that I thought, I, I, these are all paintings I'd like to make. Um, and he said, uh, yeah, I, I, I think if, if I choose from, or if, if I allow you to make the painting that you want to make, it'll be better. Yeah. And uh, I, I think there's truth to that. I think, um, but, but it's, it, in, in my experience, that's, that's a rare um, opportunity to have a commission for whatever, yeah. whatever you want to make. And, um, yeah, the client's opinion is it should be as good as you can make it. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That was great. Um, there, there is a, a certain, um, yeah, like you said, in terms of be, becoming jaded, you'd, you'd like to make sure that every day you're in the studio, you're, you're still have that that joy. I'm trying to talk to my kids. I've got, um, some older teenage kids now and one that's 20 and, uh, I, I'm, I'm desperate for them to live a life of passion. Um, I'm, I'm trying to ha tell them to choose something that they love, yeah. uh, and then find a way to monetize it, uh, find a way to make that your life rather than going the responsible route and, you know, becoming a nurse cause you think you can be secure. Um, um, unless your passion is to be a nurse and then great. Um, but the message is 
that, uh, and what I'm trying to get them to understand is that even when you choose your life and the path that you want it to take, most of it is work. Most of it is, mm. is difficult and not necessarily fun, right? My, my daughter's a big uh, Harry Styles fan. And I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, let's take him as an example. Most of it is living out of a suitcase, getting up early and doing press, uh, 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 costumes, you, you know, you, it's just, it's work. And the 10,000 hour concept to get there. Yeah, too. and, and uh, NBA players. I always wanted to be an NBA basketball player. And, uh, you know, most of what they do is just hours and hours and hours mm. of, of hard work, whether that's strength building or skill building. And, and then you get to play the game, yeah. right? And, and the glory of it is, you know, it looks so amazing. But those guys work and yeah. work and work on the, on the boring stuff. Like, oh, yeah. you know, I mean, you still got, I watch... I watch Steph Curry and Jimmy Butler doing dribbling exercises. We're very exercises. angry about Steph Curry right now here in <laughs> Boston. <laughs> that's true. That's, yeah, sorry. That's, that's a touchy subject. No, I mean, we can talk about it later. It's funny. <laughs> my, my, son, my son's classmate, his dad, is one of, like, the inner circle trainers of the Celtics. Yeah. Um, it was really interesting this season to talk with the father about, um, especially with COVID, right, because yeah. they sort of sequestered different groups. So he was in the player group, this very – he works – uh, with the coach on getting the players to perform as high as they can. Yeah. And it's like you're saying, it's all repetition and skill and yep. figuring out which exercises can get there. And then I got to see him the morning after the last game oh, no. while we're dropping off kids. It's no, <laughs> but Steph Curry's amazing. Like it's amazing yeah. to watch. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's a good lesson to understand because I don't think, you know, as a, as a kid growing up, you see just the fun of it. You see them dancing on the court. You see him high five and you, you see the champagne after a big victory. Mm. You see all of that stuff. You don't necessarily get to see the hours and hours and hours of, well, of it's, a, it's a 20th century labor. myth. It's a myth that we were given yeah. that, that people are born with talent, right? That, Oh, this person, I, you know, being a parent, you, you confront this a lot. Like everybody's signing their kids up for math class and music class, but they'll readily say like, Oh, my kid, my kid's really good at drawing yeah. or my kid's not good at drawing. And they yeah. sign their kid up for a class in drawing and painting the same way. Like you would do a music class and have no idea whether it's going to be heavy metal or jazz or, yeah. you know, there's a real, especially for artists because of like the de-skilling that got popularized. Yeah. I think that we were just fed a myth that we're all born. Yeah. You know, you either have it or you don't. Yeah. And it's I, a talent and, and talent exists. Sure. Right. By all means. But part of talent is like that resilience yeah. and um, willingness to work and outwork others. Yeah. So do you like my train? I like it. It's nice. It's, it's romantic. Like you said, yeah, it's, it's romantic. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's a good lesson for artists to understand because, like we've like we've been saying, um, you do have really high peaks, especially when you're a student. You start seeing those improvements, mm. and and when you study at a really solid school, the improvements come quickly. Uh, uh, oh, the, yeah. the amount of uh, the amount that you get better in the first two or three years is it, you you make more improvement in that first two or three years than ever again. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, uh, the amount of work you put in to get the amount of improvement, the, those two things, the, the work expands, the improvement, the bell the, curve it, just it, is like right. exponential. Yeah. Um, but, um, in order to keep going, in order to, to, really make a lifetime career out of this, you have to understand how to work through, the boring aspects of it, the mm. work of it, um, because it's, it's really, really exciting to start a new painting. It's really exciting to finish a painting, but the, what week to four to six months in between those two moments mm. is work. And, uh, and you have to love it more than, more than you despise it. Well, and there's, there's another thing that happens. And I think this is very true of the Florence community that we came out of, but like, you know, there hits this point where people 
part of it is because of like the small pond, big fish thing. But you can tell that people just, they really believe that the Metropolitan's about to call them. <laughs> like, like they're sitting there in their studio and they start, well, you know, it's the, it's the best. Of course the Metropolitan's about to call. Yeah, and I don't yeah. mean this literally, right? But like yeah. there's this, this sentiment that people are just convinced that they are doing the one true way and they're adhering to it so faithfully that success is right around the corner. Yeah, yeah. Any minute now. Yeah. Any minute now, the big show is going to happen. Somebody's going to find me. And in my experience, like when, when I've gotten like, and I've, I've had a few like really amazing opportunities, right? those amazing opportunities aren't really that pivotal, right? Like they don't, they don't, they haven't defined my career the same way that I have. Like I've had big commissions. I've had good, you know, I've had good things that yeah. if you told 20 year old Leo, like, Oh yeah, I'm all set. I, I did that. Um, but it's really, it's just about the act of doing it and the willingness to, to work through, you know, some of the drudgery, I guess, like yeah. you're, like you're saying, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, where, where we live now, where the community that, you know, the kids are in school, um, it's really hard to even explain to people what yeah. I do, right? Like, oh, I'm, I can't say that I'm an artist because they think I'm like a dilettante. Yeah. But I try to explain that, you yeah, know, no, I'm a painter and I really, like, I come to my studio. Do you go there five days a week? Yeah, yeah, no, I go just like you. Yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes seven days a week. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. It's, I'm very cautious to not start thinking to myself that the phone's about to ring any minute yeah. and I'm instead trying to use the example of some, some other folks that have, you know, I just sort of watch their model as they're getting into their, you know, eighties and they still love painting. Yeah. Like they love it so much and would talk about it all day. And, and some of those people are gone. And you hear stories about them being enthusiastic to the very end yeah. and painting from a wheelchair. And yeah. like, I, I had a real live fast, die young attitude. And as soon as I started doing this, it gave me like real goals. And yeah. one of the goals is to continue doing this because I, you never know what's around the corner, what, what your work, like my work looks different than it used to. I'm so excited to see how it looks 20 years from now. Yeah. Um, so I give the, I try to give the reins over to the act of doing it and the discipline and not force it into something that I want it to be. Sure. But I try to respond to nature and the person that I am at that, you know, that juncture, I, I guess. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and you have to realize, I think the evenness we were talking about is I'm more on the high side now. The, the dips, even though the peaks might, might not be as high, I find myself just enjoying it evenly now without as many major dips. Mm. Um, I can just stay kind of in that joy plane um, and I don't get overly excited, but I really ha have minimized the yeah. amount of, of dips that I experience. Um, and I think that, um, um, I had a thought and I just lost it. Um, it's just a, it's good, it's a good, um, idea to, to, um, at, at least come into it knowing that it's work. Um, but you chose it and, and it's really fun. It's really fulfilling. You feel like you're adding something to society. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I do. <laughs> oh, you do. Uh, but, but no, I, I, I gotta say like my worst day painting, if I go paint outside, like painting, studio paintings, the studio, and the studio is a great place to keep all your things, but I love painting outdoors, yeah. right? And my worst day painting outside, maybe I don't get it, maybe I don't paint, like maybe I don't, I'm not able to do it, maybe I have to wipe it off. My worst day painting outside is still a pretty good day. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm able to take that home with me even if I don't like the way the painting went. Yeah. Um, but again, the problem is when the painting goes really well, I'm still like, did it go well? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to judge your own work uh, after a while. Um, you, you get proud of it, but I don't know what my work looks like to other people. I, I have no. no idea. I just do the best I can and um, and keep going. And I, you know, I've I sh I shut my school down largely. I mean, the the day to day uh, full four year curriculum I shut down in January. Now I've just uh, just taken on a couple of uh, mentorship students. Um, 
just kind of doing a mentorship program. And, uh, and I, you know, so I'm alone a lot more than yeah. I used to be. And, and I think that's uh, one of the things that's helped me stay even is I just get to go to my studio and, and paint. And there's, it's just so, I'm just so grateful to yeah. be able to do this every day and keep going. Um, it's certainly a, a, a pretty fantastic life uh, to, I mean, our job is observing and creating beauty. Mm. And that's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, so I want to pivot a little bit if we can, and just talk about what you're doing now. And, um, mm -hmm. you've got, you're, you definitely are one of, um, the artists that has shed a lot of the academic, uh, um, feel in your work. Uh, certainly there's the foundation of, of drawing, their uh, understanding of value, understanding of color. Um, um, you were always kind of a, a materials guru, mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, but you you're also one of the artists who has really found their own unique voice in painting. Thank uh, you. I mean, your your paintings look like your paintings. Um, I you appreciate could, you that. You couldn't mistake them for anyone else's. Um, how do you feel like you kind of came to that? What is what if you could just talk about? what your motivations are, what you're, what you're trying to attempt, uh, um, or, or trying to achieve in your paintings and, and how you, how you came to that. Cause you, you do paint the figure beautifully. You paint, uh, a lot of landscapes, a lot on, on, on location from life. Um, do you, uh, do you use, ima do you do imagine scenes? Do yeah, you, I, do, I put, do fully imagine, like I'll take a daytime painting and turn into a nighttime painting. I'll, paint fully from imagination i'll look at photos i'll go back out and work on the same painting for like five years waiting for the same sort of days in winter like i i'm a by any means necessary yeah kind of painter and i like painting everything like there's a snow painting up there i think it was like literally four winters i, yeah. I worked on but if you look at the painting I, I don't think it looks like four years of work sure um i realized pretty quickly moving back to the states that like I was, I was in Italy for a long time and I realized like you're saying that people perceive your work very differently than you perceive it yourself. Yeah. So I thought leaving, you know, leaving the school, this is now like it's 11 years ago. It's a long time ago. I came back and I, I realized that, um, although I, I thought my work looked individual, it really didn't, you know, you could see, like you could look at my paintings and you could imagine where I went to school. And I started going through the process of just trying to like, really reinvent process and figuring out what I want to paint. And I said to you earlier, like, I realize I'm not really, like, I like painting outside, but I don't really call myself a landscape painter. I teach landscape. Yeah. I love landscape paintings, but I'm nowhere near that Hudson River School vein sure. where it's like, um, you know, taxonomy as much as it is painting. I really like architecture and I really like, um, you know, different times of day and effects. And I, I realized that like, I needed to change my subject matter entirely. So I stopped painting still, still life pretty quickly after moving back. I realized that like, although I had a good thing going and I might sell consistently in, you know, galleries and commissions, I could just do, I could produce many of them. Um, but that tabletop still life thing, again, it's that diluting pool, right? There's, yeah. there's so many people that'll come out of these schools with the same skills. So I just started trying to paint things that I didn't know how to paint. Um, and architecture is a big one, right? Yeah. Like we would go out painting in Italy and you came out, you know, to the same painting things that I did in Italy. And I found pretty quickly that I liked, even though I didn't think I liked landscape painting, I loved painting outside because yeah. it was the same thing I was doing since I was 12, right? I'd go outside and paint all day. Yeah. And that sense of adventure that you go somewhere and you don't know what you might find. The big difference is now I take my painting home with me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I do. And you don't, you don't get raided. Yeah. Not as much. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think I, I, how should I say this? There's a difference between your aesthetic compass, the things that you appreciate aesthetically and your technical compass, the things that you strive to be as good as or as skilled as. Um, I realized 
after moving back that as much as I can appreciate like the skill of a Bougaro and the guy's amazing, like that's not really what I've ever been after. Yeah. That was something I studied a lot in school because it was about like rendering and edges and creating like tactile form. And um, I realized pretty quickly coming back that I was like much more involved growing up thinking about like vaguely Boston school stuff. Like I had Boston school posters in my room when I was a kid. I'd go to the museum and I'd buy posters and postcards and, and I didn't even know they were from Boston. Um, but also like impressionist stuff. Yeah. I think to me, even before I went to Florence, like the magic of painting is that it is an, a, not just a dynamic, it's a, it's a dynamic relationship with the viewer that a painting looks ostensibly different at 30 feet than 20 feet than sure. 10 feet. And it looks different at different times of day. And that is achieved not by um, just doing a painting, but by thinking very carefully about layering, um, thinking very carefully about transparency versus opacity, thinking very carefully about paint structure. Um, so I think I started to apply some of the craftsmanship of Florence, like how do you do an impasto and how do you glaze and how do you layer a painting um, to subjects and things that I would never have painted there. Um, there's a painting out from the roof that I did here um, looking out. It was one of the first big, like, over 30 by 40 inch paintings I did when I moved back. And I remember being back in the States, like, what do I paint? And it's just a view look of a sort of suburban street, and you can see, like, a street sweeper and a pickup truck in it. And you're looking down, and you can see Boston in the distance. And it's kind of like working class neighborhood meandering towards Boston. And I did this huge painting, and I think that's the one that kind of broke me. I was like, oh, okay, so it could be anything. It could be anything. I'm, I'm, I'm the vehicle. Yeah. It's not the subject. It's me. Right. Um, so I think that that experience was very formative of like painting something that I didn't find beautiful, but making, I'll show you the painting later. It's, yeah. I think it's, I think it's a nice one, an older one, but it's nice. Um, and then there's, you know, the experience of me thinking that my work to look very individual and somebody just glanced at my paintings and were like, oh, you're from the Florence Academy. Yeah. You know? Right. And, and that was ego crushing yeah. at that time. Well, it's a good, it's a good uh, realization. I, I think that it's a maturing moment. I remember being in Florence and seeing Ben Fenske visiting his studio. And um, that dude will paint anything, anytime, anywhere. Um, and I remember, uh, you know, I think Tim McGuire was room roommates with him. You may say that's true, but I've been with Ben driving for hours and he won't paint anything. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's, it's not always he will paint anything. Sometimes it's he will paint nothing. Yeah. So. Looking for the exact right thing. Well, the lesson I learned was uh, I think he had sketches of Tim standing at the stove making coffee. Mm -hmm. You know, it was this 10, 15 minute sketch. Yep. and. Um, it wasn't a conversation with him. It was just my impression of, of a yeah, lot of yeah. the sketches he had around the studio. And, and that was a lesson for me. Like, you, not, you, it doesn't have to be the absolute perfect light, the absolute perfect setup, the absolute That's perfect right. angle, the absolute perfect you know, temperature in the room. Uh, um, you have to just love painting and, and be willing to tackle anything that moves you at yeah. any moment. And, and I think um, the other... Uh, issue uh, is what you were saying earlier about Bouguereau. I, I remember even just last October, I was in Paris and I went to the uh, Petit Palais and uh, there was two paintings I hadn't seen. Um, probably they were in storage when I was there previously, but um, they'd pulled them out and it was an, a, a water house and an Almatatama right next to each mm -hmm. other. Almatatama was maybe this big and it had women and landscape excuse me landscape in the background and then this uh rose bush in, in the foreground roses were just just tiny and every leaf every rose was painted immaculately mm -hmm. uh and then the water house by contrast had so much uh abstract uh, um just vibrant brushwork mm -hmm. in the background and standing there i realized like and i don't think this realization can come unless you have a ton of years painting, not a ton of years, but several years at least, uh, painting experience to say to yourself, 
what is it about painting that I enjoy? I would hate making that Alma Tatama. If I had to like reproduce mm -hmm. that, the way that he had to paint to, to get mm -hmm. that is not a way I, that I enjoy painting. Uh, and even though I love looking at it, mm -hmm. I love that someone did it um, in terms of, of process and what, I enjoy um, just from a from a how I you know move the brush and and whatever uh, that would be so laborious for me. I would mm -hmm. absolutely hate painting if I had to do it that way. Yeah. In contrast, the Waterhouse was far more free than yeah. I feel like I've ever allowed myself to be, and so. I, I thought that's a direction I'd like to move is, yeah. is finding a little bit more freedom and, and ability to suggest and abstract things. And that's so a good way to say it. Um, it was, it was a good lesson for me in just to, to self assess in front of these master works, try to figure out what it is that uh, is just fun. Again, it's the difference. There's the technical compass. Yeah. You can appreciate in my case, like I can appreciate Bouguereau all day long, yeah. but I don't really want one in my house. Yeah. You know, it's not the painting I want to look at, right. you know, morning, noon, and night. Um, and then there's the aesthetic compass. There's things that I don't know why I like it, but I love it. Yeah, yeah. You know, so maybe it breaks compositional r rules or it's quirky, but like there's the paintings that I return to are often ones that I, I would never paint like that. Yeah. Like I look at it, I'm just like, whoa, it's, it's weird or kind of ugly and the same is true of music like we yeah. don't like forgettable music yeah we like things that are individual and surprise us and um i don't know there's um i think at the heart of it like i'm not really into literal representations in painting i i like the power of suggestion like yeah. you just said much more i like the the physicality of brushwork and and calligraphy um and movement you know, whether that's in the literal brushwork or in the composition and design. Um, I think if something is really well designed and really beautifully painted, it's beautiful no matter how representational it yeah. is, right? Um, but I think that because of the skill search, people get so addicted to their technical compass, yeah. they forget about the other bit. And I, and I would say that a lot of the people that really love um, that sort of like really tight and I'm not trying like I, I love Bouguereau I'm not trying to like but, sure. but the people that really love him it's as if they're looking at photos of the work yeah. where they imagine the way it's rendered but if you look at that work up close like it's full of it's really broken yeah man yeah. like you yeah. can see like actual directional hatch marks yep. in whether it's in the shadows or in the lights and I don't know maybe it's it, so living uh, it, to, to, to me, like a lot of, uh, I guess, painters that would hold Bouguereau up as, as you know, their god uh, tend, tend to really um, flatten their form. Not flatten the form, sorry. Um, well, flatten render, the surface. Render it. Yeah, yeah render the, the form, surface, and, but flatten the surface. Uh, but when you see a Bouguereau, there, it's so living because he painted the flesh blotchy. There's yeah. a there's a broken sort of blotchiness that actually feels like you could you could pinch it and when it's too too smooth it it, it just kind of feels maybe a little bit more plasticky right um, but yeah I think that's a good a, important um, self awareness and again I don't know if it, well at least for me I I couldn't have come to that place where it, I even realized that without having done a thousand paintings before mm -hmm. that. Um, because I knew, I knew basically the process that I have been using and where, where I've had the most fun and what's been the most laborious. Um, mm -hmm. and so now I can look at master paintings and re it, I, it resonates with me on a different level, uh, beyond the aesthetic. I think, could I make that painting? Would I want to make that painting? Um, and, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good, it's a good level of self-awareness. So your paintings tend to be a little, have that sort of um broken quality the you, the brushwork is evident the the color is is a little bit more broken um and vibrant uh um and again not not necessarily academic so that's something that you just kind of slowly yeah. came to it's funny like people come to my painting classes and they imagine that i'm like 
because I, I, I think that it's fair to say I've gone like much more in a colorist direction. So people imagine that I'm like really loosey goosey and, but I'm uh, routinely surprising people because it's all, you know, design and yeah. values and setting up strong tones so that you can work within that. I really like impressionist painting in general, I think, things that look quite different depending on how you view them. And just to like plant a little flag here, I think that the precursors to these, um, these atelier schools today, whether it's you know Florence Academy where we went or any of them, um, I think a lot of them have forgotten that like the people that gave these, those programs, like take Ives Gamel, right? He ranked Claude Monet as a top five painter of all time. For him, it's, he, he was the same um, optical development in like technology that uh, Velasquez was. Hmm. Um, but how much did you hear Monet talked about um, in a kind way when you're in the school, right? Yeah. Like it's yeah. almost as if he didn't exist. So moving back, I realized that like that impressionist painting is actually straight out of like Baroque optical painting. Yeah and looks so different depending on how you view it and when you view it. Um, and it becomes interactive in a way that like is really exciting and delighting for the viewer. Um, so I try to employ as much, well, I've, I've, read, I've read old books, right? And it's in all of them, but nobody teaches. So, um, you know, Harold Speed calls uh, dither. Mm -hmm. You know, this this open openness to the brush and willingness to leave um, calligraphy and mark making. Um, John Carlson, I think, calls it quality and um, the, the quality envelops like both the surface quality um, and that broken color kind of approach. Um, Burge Harrison um, has a whole chapter on color vibration, yeah. which I think. I would wager 98% of the people painting landscapes today have never read that chapter. Right. Um, it's a great book. And as a funny caveat, I've been recommending people that book for years, but I didn't reread it until like a year ago. And there's like a fairly racist first chapter in there. Yeah. So I now have to give the caveat like, whoa, I've been recommending this book for years. <laughs> yeah. The color vibration chapter is excellent. Yeah. Like he talks about how he does it and very few people, um, I think we're able to paint with as much um, effect in color vibration and layering as the brothers Harrison, yeah. uh, Alexander and Burge both. Um, so there's a text, like it's right there. You can read it. Yeah. And um, they're, they're excellent. Like all of them give you a little something. It's a willingness to let one layer show through to another layer, yeah. to not paint everything every day right. and to layer things differently, to allow um, a first layer brush stroke to interplay with a fi final layer glaze. Yeah. Um, for me, that can create, uh, what I strive for is to create kind of like a jewel-like surface that when you view it because of the subsurface light scattering of the paint and the opacity of some of the impostos related to the washy bits in some of the first layer to some of the more transparent sort of, that it starts to glow right. and almost emit a sense of light back at you. That search in my painting is completely unchanged from the time I did my first cast painting or whatever at the Florence Academy. I was just like, okay, this is all about exciting light effect, right? Yeah, like form, form is great, but I think that the thing that sets a painting apart is just how striking it is. Yeah. You can have a room, I want that- As, a, a, as a tangible object. Yes, just as, as a thing. Yeah. How, how much does it call to you? Because we've all had the experience of being proud of a painting and putting in an exhibition, which, you know, it's always nice to have a painting in a show. And you get to see it in the context of all these other artists there. And it's pretty obvious that there's some paintings that are really great, but are just ostensibly totally forgettable. Yeah. Right? And those people worked hard on those paintings. I never want to waste my time on something like that. I want my paintings to look, as you said, like kind of individual and... and to maintain a kind of vibrancy yeah. so that when I think that the first step is the non-negotiable, non-negotiable piece is strong design, that the interplay of shape and light and dark is striking enough that from not 30, but 50 feet away, yeah. it calls to you and you would look at it rather than right. its neighbor. Um, 
I think after that, the jewel-like surface thing that I talked about, which sounds really lofty and stupid, but it's like really, that's really what I think about is I'm trying to yeah. create a, a faceted surface that looks different depending on how you look at it. That, that helps. But without the strong design, I just don't think you have anything. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, as you said, I'm a materials guy and I've obsessed about materials for years. I was kind of the main materials guy in Florence after Adrian Gottlieb left and he taught me a lot of stuff. And then I taught a lot of people stuff. And I got to say, like watching all those people that you teach to use really high quality materials, there's all these people that use this amazing quality stuff to make paintings the same as Rembrandt did to create paintings that why did they even do them? Yeah. You know, like it's great to use good stuff, but a really good painter can do a painting with ketchup. Yeah. You know, and I, and I mean that, right. As a materials guy, I, I have so much, I really notice when somebody, like if, when I go up close to somebody's painting, it can be a bit of a letdown if it's painted on like kind of a crappier surface. It just doesn't yeah. show. Sure. I almost wish I could give him like, try this next yeah, time. Yeah. Um, but it is like, it's not everything, you know? Yeah. I've seen beautiful paintings on cardboard. It's, yeah. it's, it's about a sensitive relationship between the artist or painter and the surface, and then the end object, which someone should long to have in their home and stare at like a TV. Yeah. Um, well, like you said, uh, you know, good design, I think, good, uh, a poorly executed painting with good design is always more appealing than a well-executed painting poorly designed. Yeah. Uh, design and and that's um, uh, certainly has something to do with personal aesthetic, uh, but it sounds like so much of what you um, think about when you're painting is, is design oriented. We were talking earlier about you know the difference between uh, um, what we're taught at school is is how to make this look like that, right? Yep. How to take the presentation of an object and represent it on mm -hmm. canvas. That's that's pure representation. Mm -hmm. It's just a representation of what you're observing. And I think that's important in terms of of learning, right? You're just trying to understand how things work. Yep. Um but ultimately uh you know one thing that you were, you were talking about is um uh you know making sure that your paintings look like paintings. Mm. Uh, uh, you want them, you, you don't want to, to, even though you may use photography, partially imagination, uh, working from life, um, it, it has to be uh, how you interpret what you're, what you're looking at and, and yeah. relative to the painting you're trying to make. Uh, you're not just going out and saying, oh, that's a nice building. I'm going to paint that building. You're really thinking about from corner to corner on this canvas how am I going to design this so that uh, as a work of art, it's a, it stands alone. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's a, for me, that's a great lesson because like I, I, um, I do use photography uh, uh, quite a bit. I, I use imagination a lot as well, but I do think one of my, one of the things that I'm trying to overcome is um, um, pure representation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of, I've, I've found a way to do that in landscape. I've been a little less successful with my figure work. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's probably why my landscapes have, have been more widely appealing to people. Um, because there's a, there is a, a stronger uh, motivation from a design standpoint. Well, you've always been good at them. Like I remember your landscapes from 2002 or whatever when you came were tighter and brighter let's be honest, like there was no tradition in the Florence Academy at that point right, of landscape right. whatsoever. If you reread the materials for landscape painting at that point, there was no blue yeah. on the list. It was a brown, a black, a yellow ochre, and an English red. And like, yeah, you can, you can make a painting with that. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you were painting landscapes already that looked like actual landscapes and not like, you know, this murky... Yeah, yeah. Murky brown gray thing. Uh, yeah, I think I was doing landscapes because I couldn't afford models and the landscape models were free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was it was just a way of uh, uh I had to pay to do a landscape recently. I had to get into the park. I had to pay I was really weird. I'm like, this is just like a model. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
So, um, yeah, I, I know you've got some things coming up uh, and things to do, so I don't want to um, take too much of your time, but I would love to know, like, what, what you have going on. Um, if we could let people um, know, uh, you know, your website, Instagram, um, if yeah. you have any workshops coming up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm, always, I'm always teaching a little bit. I, I have a small group of students. I keep a mailing list. And I found that that's the nicest way to go about it. I, I've even stepped back from advertising stuff online. So I have, um, I have a group of people that I just send out um, blast to and they show up for classes. So I do run um, occasional weekly classes here. I'm probably gonna start up in the fall again on Thursdays and people just work on their own stuff. So some of the people have already been through an atelier program. Some people are beginners. It's, it's really open and it's just an open form discussion while we paint a bit like the studio that was the most helpful for that was, were you in Puerto Romano when there was no walls? No. Okay, so there was a point. So everybody knows, like, the atelier thing is all, like, cubically, and everybody, like, turns their work around and hides it. But the first year that that studio opened, um, there was no walls. So everybody all just worked in the same space. Yeah. So that's how I've always taught since. So when um, me and my old studio mates would teach in Florence, we took that model, right, that everybody just would discuss painting together. And that's how I do workshops as well. Yeah. It's everybody is kind of in an open discussion. So I have uh, sometimes classes here in the studio. I host other folks for workshops. I always have interesting people coming. I never say who they are until I send out the email blast usually. Um, but I take pride in bringing people to New England who have never taught here. Yeah. So it might be somebody's only opportunity to study with whoever, right? The, sure. the people that have come and taught. Um, I have a landscape workshop I'm going to do in the fall and here in the Boston area. And then the big thing is I think next year we're going to do our first Greek workshop. So my, oh, wife, cool. my wife's from Greece and I've painted Greece for years and it is just the most gorgeous place to paint. You have yeah. reliable weather, great food, it's inexpensive. Um, but it's a little opaque for Americans because of the language stuff. And the places that I paint are not the places in the guidebooks, I think. Yeah. Anyway, I found a great location. I think that will likely happen summer 2023. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, I, that I have, fun. I, I have go. stuff. You can, you can. <laughs> I imagine there'll be like, there'll be the students and there'll be a separate house of just like random people want to yeah. come and paint. Um, no, Greece is awesome. I mean, Rob Bodum moved there. You know, yep, you know. Yep, so yep. Rob from the sculpture department married my wife's cousin. Okay. So Rob and I are cousins-in-law, and our in-laws have adjoining properties. Nice. So Rob's been there setting up his sculpture program yeah. and teaching workshops and stuff. And um, the last time I went there, we were starting to put our heads together about like more long-term plans. Me doing stuff over there, because it's it's an untapped resource, yeah. frankly. Um, Italy's great and I yeah. miss Italy, but, um, there's a million cool things going on in Italy you can do for painting classes. Yeah. And I'm very sure that what I put together in Greece would be very different. Than sure. Like, you know? Yeah. I, I, we're planning a, we have a workshop coming up. Well, it's kind of a workshop retreat, um, in Zion, uh, in October, Zion national park in Utah. And, um, the idea was to have a, a bunch of like just friends, artists that mm -hmm. I know come together and, and paint the landscape. And then I was like, well, dang, this is a really good group of artists. Maybe we should open up, open it up as a workshop as well. Yeah. Um, cause we got two, uh, luxury homes donated for the week, which was kind of the, I love getting donated homes. Oh my gosh. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, right at the edge of the park. And, um, this one we've got, uh, gosh, Travis Schlott, and Sebastian Jupil are coming over from from Paris. Uh, Patricia Watwood, Greg Mortensen from New York, um, uh, Ben Bauer, uh, uh, Scott Talman Powers. Uh, I'm going to miss some. Julia Aristide, Zoe Frank, uh, uh, Kim Lordier, Lynn Sanguidolce. But it's something I want to do more in the future is like plan mm -hmm. one of those every year where you have like 
10, 15, like top tier artists. Yep. Um, and you know, that would rotate cause I just, I have so many people I respect and want, would love to, to work with. For me, it's like summer camp and I get to like hang out with all these guys, get to know, uh, you know, guys and girls and get to know them better, see their painting methods, have those late night conversations. Um, that's really the motivation and then yep. open it up for people to, you know, come to one workshop and get 10, 12, uh, different, different approaches, um, and see those. So we're, this is sort of the first time we're doing it and I'd, I'd love to, to do a lot more of that in different locations. In the I mean, it's a good, we have a version of that kind of happening here. You can come. It's, um, it's, uh, every winter in March, we meet in, um, on Mount Mansfield in Vermont. And, uh, I mean, there was like 60 people there. Wow. Um, one year it's a, um, it's not a workshop. It's not organized. There's no lanyards or yeah. people wearing aprons or visors. Nobody's in charge or no, no, yeah, not, yeah. I mean, sort of, uh, there's galleries in town and the concept is that to revitalize this area that's very important to the history of, um, American impressionism, New England landscape painting. So the foothills of Mount Mansfield, were made very famous by, you know, um, Aldro Hibbard and Emil Gruppi and all these great, like, New England kind of impressionist painters painted Vermont so well. And what they did was they'd meet there in the fall after, after peak when the leaves have fallen, and they would meet there in the winter. And if you meet the people around town, they, they've, they all remember always having seen people out with mm. easels. And it hit this point where some of my um, painting friends like uh, Stape, Stape Kearns and TM Nicholas, um, they were up there and having dinner and looking around and realizing they were now the youngest guys in the room. And um, yes, they put together this like massive thing. And it's, it's really neat because the people, it's not organized in the same sense that like you're describing, but it's got um, a lot of energy there is a certain energy that comes when a bunch of people just when those easels come together and it's hectic. It can yeah. be difficult to find parking. Yeah. Um, but it's beautiful and it's a self-selecting group because everybody who comes is willing to paint, you know, New England winter outdoors yeah. all day. Right. Uh, so what's cool about those conditions, in my opinion, is really hard to paint, right? Like to do anything is yeah. really hard. But to paint in adverse conditions is yeah. fascinating because you can see the difference between someone's technique and another's and how effective it is. And it tracks that the people with the most experience are able to get sort of the most work done, no matter what the weather is. Yeah. Right. Whereas other people, you know, sort of go up there and decide, maybe I'm a portrait painter. <laughs> yeah. Um, and or, that is or true. Or a studio painter. Yeah. No, no. I mean, I enjoy the uh, comfort of the uh, air conditioned studio or heated studio. Yeah, we had a guy show up with no jacket a few years oh, ago, boy. pre COVID. And, and you need, you need pretty special gear. But seriously, you can come to that if you want. It's in March each year. Yeah. Um, it's fairly open door. Um, but the idea is that it's like, it's, it's not a marketing opportunity. Sure. It's a, it's just painting where others have painted because it's a beautiful location. Yeah. And it's that simple. And getting together with other artists and hanging out. And That's right. Those conversations. People will meet for yeah. dinner. People will meet for breakfast. Yeah. But it hits a point where I don't even think it would be possible for everybody to get together. Yeah. Um, so I, I really like participating in that because I don't like, I don't really like the things that are too organized. But I do like being around other people. Like you, you're saying, yeah. painting in your studio is very solitary. Yeah. So there's, there's really something positive about like seeing other people's approach, painting next yeah. to them, exchanging ideas. Um, I like that idea a lot. Yeah, I really got that w when we did the Hudson River School, I think summer 2007 and summer 2008. That's where I, I you know, we just spent a month each, each of those summers. You know, we stayed in the same house hung out, uh, you know, told fart jokes, mm. ate our meals together, yep. uh, went to the movies on the weekend together, uh, you know, and spent 12 hours a day in the forest, yep. just pounding it out, uh, uh, you know, learning and figuring it out and studying the landscape. And 
um, throwing rocks and uh, whatever. It was just, it's the kind of like camaraderie and um, um, the, the friendship building that for me is, um, I don't know, it's the impetus for this podcast really. Yeah. Cause I just found myself like every time I travel looking up artists and having amazing conversations. And every time I did, I thought, man, how do I even share that? How do I tell people about that experience? How do I tell them about their studio? How do I explain you know, how deeply these artists think and how, uh, how purposeful they are in their work. Um, and so, um, yeah, I hope I'm, you know, able to, to share a little bit of that, uh, through this podcast. Cause you know, walking into the studio, I mean, this is a pretty spectacular studio. Um, but everyone has their own space and they, they, everyone's, it's so interesting to, to get a glimpse into yeah. it behind the scenes of what motivates people and what, um, you know, what goes into their work. So, um, thank you for letting me come and well, sure, check, man. check your space out. And I'm going to get a few shots, uh, uh, of the studio and, but thank you for, um, you know, giving me some insight into your work. Uh, I mean, it's unbelievable. I, I love what you're doing. It's, oh, thanks, uh, man. I've been a fan for a really long time. Um, so I'm glad I got to got to finally see the space. Um, and just lastly, I want to uh, spell your name because it's uh, uh, Man- Mancini. M A N C I N I. Dash Horesco is the one you need to spell. H R H R pause H R and then E S E S K O because nobody believes it's H R. Yeah. So uh, they can find you. That's what your Instagram thing is, right? Yep. Mancini Horesco. Yep. And the so website same thing yep okay website's only half up right now i have things baking but if they want to um like get on that mailing list yep they can do that through the website yep and you can email me my teaching email this is waltham massachusetts it's waltham.studios at gmail.com i just have like an automatic mailing list that it's it's a good system yeah because it feels friendly it feels like i'm emailing people i know and i have people that have come from as far as like texas california peru a guy came up from peru for a workshop like i don't even know who's up but they're all people that i'm tangentially connected to somehow yeah, yeah and i i really like it you know i like that i didn't set out doing this thinking i would teach or host workshops or do workshops myself but it's been a really gratifying part of this because I like talking like you know at a certain point you're just a nerd for it you just want to talk about all the ins and outs and why and having a hungry audience is always nice and uh uh, I'm sure they could reach out to you through the same email if they're interested in purchasing work commissioning things uh where are you showing at the moment uh so I have a batch of paintings that's going now to the Bryan Gallery in uh Jeffersonville Vermont that's right next to where I was talking about um, I participate every year. Um, this is like a local thing. Put on your radar too. Um, it's called the Rockport um, Art Association Museum. So Rockport is an old artist colony, and my friends here in Massachusetts have worked very hard recently to revitalize this old um, art association. And they have, um, you know, a national show. They give prizes and stuff. But it's um, that's 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 another thing that I try to do every year because it's, it's good to participate in taking something that really was a super impressive place that got a little turned more towards Sunday painting. Yeah. And I think is, um, if you walk around there right now, there's, there's a bunch of really interesting work and, um, yeah, it's, I think it's a, a good time cause here in New England, there's enough really serious painters that there's these self-created opportunities start to show up too, you know? So I put work out at galleries, but I've also really enjoyed recently, like seeing my friends open artist run galleries. Yeah. Like and, co-ops. Yeah. And open or personal or open, you know, galleries of historic work. So I don't know. I think Massachusetts right now has a lot of uh, interesting painting stuff going on and a good sense of like overall painting community. Yeah. On uh, top of the New Salem Museum, which I was at in, in January, yep. which is how far away from here? That's an hour, basically. Oh, really? Yeah, I was, I was there shortly after you were there. Okay. It was, really, it was really fun to see the space before it opens and yeah. let my kids run around. 
Yeah. Um, my, it's my, beautiful. Daughter, my daughter is the youngest visitor yeah. that they've had. So for nice. now, for nice. now, she'll get beaten out. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff in Boston. There's these smaller community museums. Um, the Worcester Art Museum has an awesome collection. Uh, the Courier Museum of Art up in New Hampshire across the border. Like, of course, Massachusetts has the Clark and the Museum of Fine Arts and the Isabella Stewart Gardner. But very few, few people realize that all these smaller spaces have incredible paintings. Yeah. Um, I think I've become very interested in searching out other artists that maybe wouldn't be on the greatest hits CD of, um, you know, I bring up the Brothers Harrison or yeah. whatever. Like, there's people that I, I really gravitate towards their work, but you're not going to find them in the big museums. Sure. So searching out the smaller stuff is, is really fun. Yeah. And New England's full of that tradition. Right. You know? Yeah, we're thinking uh, about moving uh, back east here uh, next summer my wife graduates and um, one of the things that I mean one of the big motivators for me is the museums just because there's so much dialogue you can have with the masters and and uh, yep. you know they become part of your artistic community when you well, when you have access totally. to them and there's a real cultural understanding here I mean like New York New York is New York right and you can probably do more business in a weekend than you can in a month in Boston that said um, here there's everybody you meet because it's a intellectual capital because of the universities and the dot-com industries that are all lining here in Waltham um, and all the biotech stuff that's taken off. Uh, even though it's hard for me to explain to people what I do um, because, you know, what I do is very different. There's a lot of appreciation and support for it, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that that sort of like cultural support that exists in New England is, is important to me. Having yeah. moved back here from Europe where there was so much of that. Right. Um, there's just, there's a little piece of it here and I think it helps. I, I have found a, a slight difference or maybe not slight, maybe it's deeper than uh, I realize because, you know, I haven't spent mountains of time out east um but in my short experience there's a there's a different um there's a different connection to uh, uh cultural appreciation mm -hmm. than in the west you know my wife's from california spent a lot of time there uh, you know in a culture where everything's new uh, all the buildings are new all yeah. the homes are new everything is like new money and uh, all of it um i i think uh there's just it, it, more of a surface uh, acceptance and appreciation for cultural things, whereas here it's things have been around a little bit longer, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think um, it just seems to me that there's a, a greater appreciation for um, rich elements of culture like art or m music or food or whatever that runs a little bit deeper. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd love to... Weren't uh, you going to move to Paris at one point? Oh, my gosh. I've had so many plans to no, move but I so remember. Many I think places. last time I talked to you, you were... The idea... Yeah, that was the idea. Uh, my... <laughs> I, I'm very immature in how I think. I, I always have, like, big ideas, and then I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And then I start to, like, figure out all the logistics, and mm. sometimes the logistics are just way too... Uh, expansive for me to figure out and Paris was one of those things it was yeah. you know before the Paris Academy started I went and met with the guy who started it and uh, he's like you married with kids and you're the only one that works and I was like yeah he's like you could never live here it's impossible mm. you just uh, and, and it ended up being impossible for me just financially it was it wasn't um, it wasn't possible I mean we did dream about going back to Europe there's yeah. something, I mean, for artist kind of routine, it would be, my day to day would be easier. Oh yeah. There. Yeah. I, um, I think the quality of life in, in a lot of European countries is, is actually better than the United States. The food quality is better. The, the slowed down pace is a mm -hmm. little bit better. Uh, um, <laughs> socialized medicine is better. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we, we've talked about moving to France as well. I mean, there's so many like really cool properties for sale way cheaper than you can yeah. get in the United States. Like our home pr prices in Utah are stupid 
yeah. uh, right now. And we're lucky that we have some equity and, and we could we could make a move at this point. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, America's America's getting scarier. Uh, you know, I, I'd love for my kids not to have to go through active shooter drills at school. Is that happening? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. It's, uh, it's I mean, scary. I, I think I think that we feel I mean, this is still America, right? But yeah. it's like it feels a little bit isolated from it here. Like it feels that what you just said, like I haven't really confronted that yet. Right. We've had yeah. to have the conversation. They've had to talk about it in school. Yeah. But like that concept hasn't yet occurred to me. Yeah, it's it's scary. And I live I, I live in a red state. You know, we have more of the, uh, you know, Trump supporting um, gun toting uh, people around and, um, you know, it's, it's hit home a yeah. little bit. I mean, we had, my daughter's friend was, you know, picked up from school and murdered here just a few weeks ago. Um, and, uh, you know, there's several shootings just in my area, um, well. recently within the last few months. And I live in a small town in a really nice, you know, yeah. nice meaning like everybody's super nice. The community is really nice. Yeah. Um, uh, I, uh, you know, it's easy to get along with everybody there, but yeah, there's just certain realities that, um, I don't know if I want to, I don't know. I really don't. I mean, I'm at a place right now in my life where I have no idea what my next step is. So I think in the next, within the next year, I'll, I'll try to figure some things out. And, uh, you know, maybe we end up in France, maybe we end up in Connecticut, maybe, I, I don't know, yeah. but it's kind of exciting, um, to, to have that, uh, you know, unsure quality anything's possible, but, but I, I'd love to be, you know, if I, if I go to Connecticut, I'm two hours from here, I'm two hours from New York. And I, I feel like I could kind of have a more expansive community because, um, I'm, I, I'd be making that trek yeah. regularly. And yeah, I mean, that's that's the nice part about it here is like the, in the same time that I can drive from this studio to Central Park in Manhattan, I can be in the heart of Mid Coast, Maine, yeah. or on top of Mount Mansfield in Vermont. Right. As it turns out, I'm making the trip to the city less, um, but it's still there. Yeah. And I yeah. can go when I need to. I have to go to New York today. Yeah. So it's like, it's that there's a level of convenience. Yeah. And, um, and I think the cultural thing is true. Like there is, you know, this isn't the sort of place where people look disdainfully on, um, you know, the job that we do, right? They, they have enough understanding for it. They don't understand why or how, but they, you know, they can appreciate that that yeah. needs to be done. And, um, and yeah, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of artists around here. And I think we've created a pretty supportive community around us here slowly and it's taken a long time yeah but i feel like this very much feels like home and i'm really happy to be here yeah um but yeah the next step is as the kids grow to figure out how we can divide time more and set up more business stuff in greece sure um as as the years go ahead yeah you know. yeah well i hope i'm a I hope i i can our paths cross a lot more uh frequently in the future um because, yeah, we've, we've known each other a long time, but we just not spent, uh, I haven't spent as much time with you as I would have liked. So, um, Podcast again, is a good way to, you have me like strapped to a chair. Yeah. That's a really good way to do it. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, again, thank you for, for let, you know, give me this time and, uh, and hopefully we see more of each other yeah, soon. Man. We can do this again sometime. Like yeah. it's, it's fun. It's fun to talk. I like the podcast model. I think it's a good way to just sort of like present the way that people really are, not edit it into something else, right, but right. just, you know, it's, it's Leo's studio. Right. You know? Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you.